What's up, what's up, wherever you're joining us from, we're so excited that you are here. We're going to worship the Lord because He is here. Hallelujah. <laughs> is anybody excited to be in the house of the Lord? Awesome. Let's worship the Lord with these songs. Come on, let's go. Put your hands together. Come on. Hey. Thank you, Jesus, for your faithfulness. Receive all the praise, oh God. Put your hands together. Come on.
you are God and you are our God and indeed your work surprises every day you keep on doing great things and you're a miracle working God we trust we trust you with our lives with our families we trust you with all that we have and all that we will ever have we put you in the rightful place as the risen king in our lives the Lord you will remain sovereign that your name and your name only will be glorified we believe that you are here and because you are here our miracle is here thank you Jesus
God, we love you. We need you. Reign in our hearts, reign in our lives. You are King, you are God, and we welcome you in this space. We welcome your promises, and we welcome your name. And it is in Jesus' name, God's people worshiped and praised, and we said, Amen. Amen. Hey, 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 I hope uh, you've enjoyed that time of music and dance and that uh, it was a time for you to just to reflect on what God has been able to do over your life, even as we zoom past uh, this month of April. At this point, uh, as a church, we'd like to invite you to a time of giving of your tithes and offerings. Every Sunday and every time that God blesses us, we want to take from that increase and to be able to respond to him in the manner of giving. And I have a verse uh, in uh, uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 5, the Bible says, uh, uh, Paul is talking about uh, these guys from uh, a city in Macedonia. I believe it was a church in Philippi. And he's talking about them. And he's talking about their heart and their posture in the area of giving. And he says this, And they exceeded our expectations. They gave themselves first of all to the Lord and then by the will of God also to us. And so what Paul is saying is, these guys, uh, uh, the order of giving was that they give themselves first to the Lord and then by the will of God also to us in the manner of finances. And that shows us how we give when it comes to church. The more you want to be able to respond to God in the manner of giving, you start by responding to him, by giving him your heart, by giving him your life. And as you see his goodness, giving financially then becomes as a response, not as an activator, but as a response to what God has been able to do. Are you struggling in your area of giving? Maybe instead of checking your theology on giving, maybe what you should do is check your relationship with God. Because the more you're growing in your relationship with God, hey, the more you'll be able to enjoy this time of giving. I pray for all of us to enjoy giving. I pray for all of us to enjoy not just giving financially, but giving our strength, giving our ideas, giving the strength of our, you know, uh, of our intellect and capacity so the church of God can be built up. As you give, may the Lord truly and honestly bless you. And let me pray for that giving. Heavenly Father, thank you for the giving of the Lord's people. As we give today, I know it's coming from an area sometimes of need, sometimes of joy, sometimes of gratitude. But I want to pray that your blessing will completely and overwhelmingly bless everyone who's giving today. Those who don't have and would like to partake in this grace of giving, may you provide for them as well. In just name we do pray and believe and all of us said, Amen. Hey everybody, welcome to this installment of the Sermon Series. This changes everything in this series. We are taking a deep dive uh, and looking into this idea of grace. Uh, the unearned, undeserved, unmerited favor from God. And we, have, we started by expounding on what grace is on week one and, and looked at that story from that first Easter there in Jerusalem. Then we, we took an Easter break and did an amazing sketch of a skit man uh, called the Emancipation. I uh, hope you enjoyed it and you've shared it with your family and friends. And then last week we looked at the trap of legalism. If you've missed any of these sermons, kindly go back into our YouTube channel, go to this playlist and you'll be able to see each and every one of those sermons. We say this, that uh, most of us know that we've been saved by grace, but after salvation, we can easily slide into the trap of legalism and start living by works, start living thinking that it works that are going to gain us favor from God. And we say that we must look into the motives of why we do the things we do in our Christian work. Now, over the Easter weekend, my dad wrote us a text, the entire family in our WhatsApp group, and, and he said, you know, he wanted all uh, of us to go to the village. My brothers, my sisters, our spouses, our children, all of us to go uh, to the village. And when we were there, he shared with us the plan that he had of dividing the family land to each and every one of us. And he said, you know, this is how I want to do it, and the ball is rolling. These are the plans that I have in place. Now, imagine with me, if 
after the Easter weekend, I chose to start doing some things for my dad. I started taking him shopping, started sending him money, started visiting him every weekend, started calling him every now and then. And the idea behind that is that I'm trying to, you know, uh, 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 make him uh, a little bit predisposed to giving me a bigger portion of the inheritance or even a, a, a prime property as he shares out the land. Now, imagine with me also that my sister, uh, I chose to say, you know what, dad, I love you. You've been my dad. You're going to give us this parcel of land anyway. But at this time, I want to know you a little bit better. I, I want to know your thoughts and, you know, uh, and heart concerning this land. And she started taking him shopping and sending him money and si visiting him, him every weekend. These two visits, I believe, well, these two things would illustrate the difference between works and grace. And that has been the focus of the last two sermon. The act of visiting and taking shopping and taking money would be the same in both cases, but the motive would be different. The first one, in this case, my, uh, my, 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 my case, it would be pure works. I'd be trying to win favor and merit by deceiving and conniving and trying to, uh, and eventually it would break my father's heart if he realized is this, that I was doing it for that sake. But the second act of my sister will be an act of love and gratitude and responding to my father's grace. That is the same with our faith. You can do good works to try and impress God so that he can notice you, so that he can give you a bigger portion of blessing or of favor and the motive there is you you're trying to get things from God is what you, you can be blessed with but you can also do good works because your heart overflows with gratitude and you deeply love God and what is done for you and so your good works are an expression of love and gratitude. They are unspoilt by performance or by favor. And we see these two kinds of people in church as well. Two people in church can do the exact same thing. You know, come to church early, serve in the Sunday school, attend for 30 a.m. prayers with mics on and mute, um, you know, uh, videos on and mics unmuted. You can give your fast fruits. You can tithe faithfully. You can give sacrificially. You can care for the sick. But all of those can, can end up, one can do it out of pure works and a second person can do it as a response to God's grace. So we ask ourselves, should we do good works? And we said yes, if they are done out of love and gratitude to, to God as a response for what is already done for you. But we also said no, if they are done to perform, to try and impress God, to weasel out a favor from him. Good works are about the motive that drives them and not just compliance to a list uh, and rules to abide to in order to win favor from God. But as I said, when this message of grace is taught, when this message of grace is taught, there are two ways in which you can respond to this uh, word. Uh, number one, there are those who take on the grace of God. We believe we are saved by grace at salvation, but we quickly add on a list to that in our daily living. And we call that the trap of legalism. And then there are those who respond to grace uh, uh, as, as, as a license to be unrestrained. And today we're going to be looking at that. We're going to be calling the sermon the trap of licentiousness. And this is when we take the grace of God as the license to be unrestrained and to do whatever our hearts desires. I want you to picture uh, this. Uh, uh, there's, a, there's a drawing I want to share with you. And, it's, uh, and, and in the middle there we have the, the path of grace and it's a wide path. It's a path that you're going to walk in. It's not just a tight rope for you to try and manage. It's a wide path for you to enjoy. But then on the far one side of, the, of, of that path is what we call the swamp of legalism. And we looked at that. And then on the other hand, we have the bog of license. So God calls us to walk that path of grace. But sometimes you can swing to the path of legalism and add lists and add rules that you can abide by to do this and do that. And that kills faiths because none of us is able to live uh, uh, under the law. None of us is able to live in that legalistic way. But then on the other side, you can take, you can, you can walk this path of grace and swing to the other side and you enter into the bog of licentiousness or the bog of license. And this is why you say, man, Jesus died for my sins and so I don't do need to do anything to impress him. And so I can do whatever I want. I can watch whatever I want. I can watch pornography. I can masturbate. Bit. I can keep my sad cheek. I can, you know, I, 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 in fact, I'm giving God the opportunity to show his grace through my life. 
And the bog of licentiousness is why you totally misunderstand God's grace and end up living uh, uh, without any moral restraints, especially when it regards uh, to sex. And so, uh, and we talked about that, uh, we're going to be looking at that uh, um, side of licentiousness uh, uh, today. We're going to be looking at, 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 at this other side, this other side that people swing into. Living by grace, living by grace means that you must walk that path of grace. Don't fall into the swamp of legalism and don't swing to the other side into the uh, bog of licentiousness. You see, Christian preachers, just like me, we often are afraid to preach the bold message of God's grace because we are afraid that people will misunderstand it. We are afraid uh, that people will end up sinning more. We'd rather preach a message of rules and a message of lists and a message of regulations in the hope that people don't misunderstand grace. But you see, the solution to misunderstanding grace is not adding legalism to it. You know, preferring legalism over, over a licentiousness is, you know, exchanging one chain uh, 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 of, to another, you know. It le still leaves you in chain. It's like when someone asks you, would you prefer to die from cancer or kidney failure? Man, you're dying both ways, yeah? And so none of them is good. And so we walk this path of, of grace without swinging to the side of legalism or swinging to the other side of licentiousness. And that is what Apostle Jude, uh, in that book of uh, uh, Jude there, just before Revelation, the last book in the Bible, uh, in Jude 4, Jude is just one book, and in Jude 4, uh, Jude is trying to uh, talk about that side, and he says, for certain individuals have secretly slipped among you. They, have, they are ungodly people who pervert the grace of God into a license for immorality and deny Jesus Christ as our only sovereign Lord. Let me tell you guys, grace is hard to grasp because people easily misunderstand it. You say, you know, salvation is by grace and grace alone. And so people think, man, if I'm saved by grace and I don't really to need to do anything, you know, I can do whatever I want. I can go on sinning. You know, God's grace is there for me. It, and it easily swings into a license to live a life of sin. So what do we say to the person who continues to sin because grace covers it all? We say no. That's not how grace works. Do not misunderstand grace as a license to do whatever you want. Romans chapter 6 verse 1, uh, all the way to 21. Uh, in fact, I think the entire uh, Romans chapter 6, Paul is again tackling this question in detail. And he goes into a little bit more details, uh, 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 even as Jude does. And he tackles this question. I want us to be able to do that with you today. We're going to be going through the book of uh, Romans chapter 6. Uh, and I'm going to be using different versions of the Bible just so that you can be able to read and understand. We're going to be reading a portion, taking a pause diving deeper into it and then continuing like that. But up to chapter 6, Paul has been expounding on this idea that we are saved by grace. But then by the time he gets to chapter 6, he realizes that people may misunderstand what grace means. And so he starts expounding on this licentiousness uh, questions. And so he says this in verse 1. He says, what then? What shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? By no means. We are those who have died to sin. How can we live in it any longer? Or don't you know that all of us were baptized into Jesus Christ, were baptized into his death? We were therefore buried with him through the baptism into his death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. Paul is saying to you and I, we have died to sin. Sin has no more power over us anymore. You know, the aborigines of Australia have this rite of passage in their, uh, for their children when they are transitioning from childhood to adulthood. They didn't have this idea of uh, adolescence. In fact, it's a very recent idea. Uh, but basically, you are childhood, then you go through a rite of passage and you become adult. Uh, you become an adult. And for the for the for uh, for the aborigines. They'll take their children who are now ready to transition into, into adulthood and they'll take them by the river and they'll cover them in white clay because they believe paleness was the color of death. And, they would, and they, would, they would dig graves and they would lay each of the child inside their own grave and then they would take them out and they'd wash the clay off the kids and right there and then the idea was that the child had died to childhood and they had now risen to adulthood. 
the same happened for you and I, man. When we went under that water of baptism, the old man died. We left the old man in there. When we were risen up again in that baptism, we rose up in Christ. And so we have died to sin. Sin has no more power over us. We are now alive in Christ. We have a good deal. Come on, somebody. We have a good deal. We have a good deal. And then, so Paul continues on to say in verse 5, he says this, For we have been united with him in a death like his. For we, are certainly also be, we will also certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. For we know that our old self was crucified with him, so that the body ruled by sin might be done away with. We are no longer captives to sin's demands because anyone who has died to sin has been set free from sin. What an amazing uh, conclusion in that verse, verse 7. That anyone who has died has been set free from sin. The law of sin can no longer work for you. Imagine with me, a bad man has been caught, like a man who has done bad things. You know, he has killed people, he has shot people randomly, he has, he has gone for mandamanos and stolen people's things. You know, he has got into relationships and, and you know, uh, dumped the ladies at will, uh, and he's a bad guy. Man, he has stolen people's memes online and reposted them like he's a bad person. And he can't even write there and say stolen. He's posting them as his. Okay, I think I'm right at this point. I'm venting. Anyway, imagine with me that that person is caught. And the evidence upon him is overwhelming. In fact, it's online. And he's taken there to the, the, the court. And the judge uh, rules that the guy is supposed to be sentenced to 120 years in prison. And then when the man hears that he's going to be in prison for 120 years, he says, what a shock! And, and then he gets cardiac arrest. So imagine with me, he's already been arrested. Then he gets cardiac arrest. So he's arrest, uh, arrested twice just like that. And he dies. At that point, the judge cannot say, oh, we really wanted him to suffer for 120 years. So drag his dead body into jail so that he can still serve in his sentence. No. In as much as a man deserves it, that would be absurd. The moment the man dies, the, 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 the law has no more power over him. He's dead. That is what the Bible is telling you and I. We died to sin. Whether you feel like it or not, I'm going to be expanding on that more a little bit next week. Whether you believe it or not, you have died to sin. Sin has no more power over you. The law of sin is dead in your life. When you accepted Christ, you died to sin and you are raising up again in Christ into his power. You no longer live for sin. You're literally a dead man walking. Now the problem with some of us is that you didn't die to sin. You only fainted momentarily. And then you woke up again and you know, <laughs> you saw your life and you're like, let me keep living this way. You know, jokes aside, have you truly died to sin or did you only just faint? Now, I want to switch to the message version as I continue these verses from verse uh, 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 10, 11 there. From now on, think of it this way. Sin speaks a dead language that means nothing to you. God speaks your mother tongue and you hang on to every word he speaks. You are dead to sin but alive to God. That means that you must not give sin a vote in the way you conduct your lives. Don't give it the day of time, the time of day rather. Don't even run little errands that are connected with that old way of life. Throw yourselves wholeheartedly and fully into God's hands, God's way of doing things. Sin can no longer tell you how to live because it is no longer your master. Come on, guys, you have a good deal. You are now living under the grace of God. As a Christian, you not only died and resurrected in Jesus, but you also died to sin. You can't live for sin anymore. Even if you wanted to, that chapter died. And even if the enemy sends some of your old-time buddies your way, and they come and tell you, you guy, my guy, let's go to Russia, a quick one for a pate, you going to drink some yanks, you know, yanks from Kamagra. You go and say, I can no longer do that. It's no longer in me. Now, some of those you guys, my guy, can start telling you, man, you're boring since you became a Christian. You are not boring. You died. Yes. It's not you. It's not like I don't want to come, but I'm, it's dead. I, 
there's nothing in me that desires to come over there. And for some of you, you need to continually realize that you're dead to that. You're dead to some of those songs that keep whispering you they need to go back to that dance floor. You need to be able to say, I'm, I'm dead over that. I'm dead on that. You know, I'm dead to that coarse language from my mouth. It's not that I don't want to say it. I'm just dead to it. There's nothing in me that wants to be able to do it. There are videos and porn sites that are waiting your appetite, whispering for you to go back, but you need to be able to die to them. For some of you, sin had been your way of life for a long time. That you know, you know that, but now you must recalibrate yourself and live for what Jesus offers you. As I said, I'm going to be expounding a little bit more on that next week. But for now, suffice it to say that Jesus has given you freedom to usher you into a new life. Verse 15 to 18. So since we have died to sin, does that mean we live any, any old way we want? Since we are free in the freedom of God, can we do anything that comes to mind? No. You know well enough from your own experience that there are some acts of so-called freedom that destroy freedom. Offer your sins for yourself to sin, for instance, and it's your last free act. But to offer yourself to the ways of God and the freedom he gives you will never end. All your lives will be, all your lives you've let sin tell you what to do. But thank God you've started listening to a new master, one who commands you, uh, one, once, uh, one whose command sets you free to live openly in his freedom. Man, Paul is telling us we are free. We no longer obey that old slave master. Back in the slave days, there are some missionaries who are called the Moravians. And the, the Moravians were determined to preach the gospel uh, to slaves. Uh, but of course, the slave masters would never accept that uh, gospel because it would present problems to them. And so the Moravians, what they would do is that they would go into slavery themselves and have someone freed uh, in their stead. And so imagine with me. That one such Moravian goes and says, you know, take me, release so and so. And as they are released, uh, the master yells to this person who's been released, hey, fetch me a cup of tea. Rightfully, that slave who's now been released should be able to say, who, me? <laughs> no, I'm not going to do that. I don't answer to you. I'm now a free man. And the same for us. Don't run any errands for that old thin slave master that you used to serve. Instead, you need to respond to the invitation that Jesus is giving you. Don't respond to the sound of sin, to the invitation of sin, to the instruction of sin. You need to be able to starve that and start living for what God is calling you into. Again, verse 19 all the way to 21. I'm using this freedom language because it's easy to picture. You can really recall, can't you? How at one time, the more you did just what you felt like doing, not caring about others, not caring about God, the worse your life became and the less freedom you had. And, now much, and how much different is it now as you live in God's freedom? Your life's healed and expansive in holiness. As long as you did what you felt like doing, ignoring God, you didn't have to bother with right thinking or right living or living, uh, right anything for that matter. But do you call that a free life? What did you get out of it? Nothing you are proud of now. What did you get? What did, where did it get you? A dead end. So now, friends, I, want, I, I don't want you to miss the point here. Paul is simply answering that question. Should we go on sinning because God has poured his grace on us? And the answer is a resounding no. And he, and he gives us, he distills three main reasons why we shouldn't. And I want you to write this down. I want you to remember this. I want you to memorize this because these are the reasons why you cannot go on sinning. You cannot go on living a life of licentiousness. And he says, number one is because you are no longer a child of the evil one. Something in you changed. You died to sin. You died to that old self. You are no longer uh, uh, even speaking the language of sin. And you, and you know, the old ways, uh, there's no, nothing in you that craves that old way of sin. It's not your nature anymore. The old master of sin was killing you. 
That's what you need to realize, guys. Sin is not bad because it's forbidden. Sin is forbidden because first and foremost, it's bad for you. Sin was killing your marriage. Sin was killing your health. Sin was killing your freedom. Sin was killing, uh, was putting you in the bondage of sensuality, in alcoholism, in pornography, in drugs and anger, in self-centeredness. Sin was killing you. You need to realize that you, know, you died to it now so that you can now live for something else. Don't fall into sin anymore. Uh, and yes, you know, once in a while you may still sin, but sin is becoming less and less appealing. You are not trying to live in it, to it anymore. And if you find yourself sinning, as we say in Kenya, Oga Urudi Soko, or as we say, Oga Urudi Kanisa, don't stay there. Rise up, realize you've messed up, and go on to live for God. Titus chapter 2 verse 11 to 12 says, For the grace of God has appeared that offers salvation to all people. It teaches us to say no to all ungodliness and worldly passions and to live a self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age. Come on, somebody. It's the grace of God that teaches you to say no. You're not. It's a grace of God. It's a grace of God. Number two. Paul is telling us the reason why you should not live for, for licentiousness anymore is because something new came alive in us from the time we accepted Jesus. Yes, not only did we die to sin, but when we came back to life, something new came alive in us. You found something far much better than the old way. Something far more freeing. Something alive. You have a new master. You have a new master and you need to keep obeying the voice of the new master and keep starving the voice of the old master. Keep starving the voice of you, my, you guy, my guy, let's go to Vasha, a quick one. And soon they'll start looking for other people to take to Vasha to look for Kabarak bombs. <laughs> yeah, start listening to the voice of God. Start obeying the voice of God. Sin will start becoming less and less appealing and you'll start listening and learning how to live for God. You not only died to sin, but now you are living for God. And then finally, Paul tells us that the reason why you should not live licentiously is because when you accepted Christ, God, you know, God entered your life through the Holy Spirit. There's a new spirit in you. There's a new software you are under. There's a new operating system that God has put you under. Oh, on the outside you may still look the same. But the Bible says that the old is gone and the new has come. Second Corinthians chapter 1 verse 21 uh, to 22 says this. Now it is God who makes us, uh, both us and you, stand firm in Christ. He anointed us, set his seal of ownership on us and put his spirit in our head as a deposit guaranteeing us to what is to come. Oh, come on, somebody. You have the power of the Holy Spirit in you and the Holy Spirit you, uh, enables you to be able to live an upright life. And so what Paul is telling us is start listening to the voice of the Holy Spirit. He will guide you in what to do. You're, he's not guiding you based on a list and rules and rituals and legalism. He's guiding you on how to live the Christian life, how to live the Christian walk. So that your righteousness is not on what you do, but you do what you do because you are righteous, you are righteous already. And so I want, I want you to pray. I want, I want to invite you to a time of prayer. For some of you, maybe it's a time for you to rededicate your life to Jesus, to just say, hey, Jesus, you know, I fainted, but I want to die. I want to surrender my life to you fully and wholly. I want, I want, you know, take, take me, take, you know, take my life, enter into my life. And if that's you today, open up your heart and just say, Lord, come into my life. Maybe for some of you, you need to, the grace to keep serving the voice of the enemy and the grace to start obeying the voice of the new master. May the Lord give you that grace so that as the enemy is inviting you into spaces, you are able to say no to that. And as, as God is inviting you to enter a new walk with him, you will have the grace to be able to walk that path as well. Most of all, I pray that God's grace would be available in everything that you do. And so Heavenly Father, thank you for anyone, everyone who's watching today. Those who want to receive you, may they open up their hearts. May you come in, may you dwell with them. And those whose hearts are opening up and saying, Lord, I need grace to starve the voice of the enemy and to respond to the voice of my new master. May you give them the grace to do just that. In the mighty and matchless name of our Lord Christ and Savior, do pray and believe. And all of us said, Amen. Amen and Amen. Thank you all. See you next week.
Hey, so we've been going through this sermon series. Uh, this changes everything. I hope you've been enjoying it. Uh, we've looked at, uh, you know, what grace is. We then looked at the trap of legalism. And today we've looked at the trap of licentiousness. Next week, we want to conclude the series by actually looking at what does living by grace mean? I, I hope you can be able to catch us on that. But more than that, as a church, we'd like to walk alongside with you. And you have an experience tailor-made for that. We call it Mizizi, which is a Swahili word for roots. And I'd like as many of you to go into the link, uh, as you can see uh, on this flyer, and apply. Let us know. We'd like to walk with you in whichever country you are. We'd like to walk with you in whichever space uh, or city in the nation you are. We'd like to be able to uh, uh, allow you to experience God's grace in a practical way alongside a community of friends. So thank you. My name is Kevin Kelonzi. See you next week.